Okay. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen from Abuja, the capital city of Nigeria. I understand you may all be joining from different time zones. So good morning or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. My name is Victor Mark Onyegbu. I am the grant manager at Africa No Filter. And I also lead on our narrative change community activities, which this webinar sits within. I would like to warmly welcome every one of you to the second ANF Academy webinar. I wish I could ask every one of us to sort of do an introduction of ourselves, uh, but we obviously cannot afford that. Nonetheless, I would like to acknowledge the presence of ANF grantees. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of intending grantees. Um, I would also like to say welcome to all the other creatives and storytellers around Africa my colleagues from Africa No Filter who work behind the scenes to make ANF what it is. And of course, are very energetic, indefatigable, tireless, and as we sometimes say in Nigeria, ever conscious executive director, Moki Makura. This webinar is being brought to you under the ages of the ANF Academy. I'll tell you a bit about the ANF Academy. Some of you might be hearing about it for the first time. The ANF Academy is an initiative of Africa No Filter, which is aimed at equipping storytellers, content creators, and creatives across media, arts, and culture in Africa with relevant skills, both to enhance their storytelling capacities and also to sustain their creative enterprises. This is in line with ANF's vision to live an empowered narrative change ecosystem and an informed community of storytellers who continue working towards shifting harmful representations of the African continent. Today, we will be discussing budgeting and financial management by two very seasoned professionals whom I will proceed to introduce to you now. Paul Nulu, whom some of you might know already from the first ANF Academy webinar, which took place in April, very exciting experience. Paul is the executive, the chief executive of Tricom Productions Limited, Abuja, Nigeria, a multimedia production and communication consulting firm he founded in 2006 to tell African stories to a global audience. With almost two decades of experience, as a storyteller and strategic communication professional, Paul has worked in philanthropy and as a professor of communications and media studies in both the United States and in Nigeria. For eight years, he held the media in, he led the media initiative at the Ford Foundation's office for West Africa in Lagos, where he managed over 38 million US dollars supporting the creation of high quality media content that increased awareness of key issues in governance and transparency, youth sexuality and reproductive health and political participation. He also supported capacity building for storytellers and promoting greater public engagement with the media to accelerate social change. From his presentation, you will learn how to align your budgets to the expectations of funders. There will be time for questions and answers after the two presentations by the two speakers we have today. And so please, I will urge you to note down your questions in the chat box. I will pay attention to the chat box as well as some of my colleagues as well. And we'll do our best to take them when it's time. And so I shall now hand you over to Paul for his presentation over the next 30 minutes. Paul, over to you. Thank you so much, Victor. Uh, again, I want to join Victor to welcome you guys to the ANF Academy. Uh, we had the first one, which was an amazing session, and uh, I'm also looking forward to a more amazing session this time. So I'm going to start sharing my screen so uh, we can follow along on my discussion. So today, as Victor has indicated, I'll be looking at you know, what a funder is looking for, for uh, from your budget when you submit your proposal. I hope you all can see the screen that I'm sharing. Uh, Victor, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it? 
At least, can you see it on your end? Okay, great, yeah. great. So, so we start by taking a look at what a budget is, and I highlighted a few words here. Budget is an estimation of revenue and expenses over a future period of time. The key word there is estimation. Your budget is an estimate. Your budget is not cast in stone. Many creatives, when they are looking for a grant, they get a grant and they worry that things might change. If things change, that is a normal thing for a budget uh, because nothing is written in stone. But again, the issue here is that so long as you have made that plan, when things do change, always inform the funder about the changes and then be able to report on those changes. A budget is a, a financial plan. So your budget enables you to be able to make a plan for the defined period of your project. So if your project is going to be an eight month project, you budget for eight months. So that's what, again, the funder is trying to look at. A budget is a categorical list of anticipated project costs. Again, your budget is often a guesstimate. It's a, it's a guess and an estimate. So that's why I call it an anticipated project cost that represents your best estimate of the funds needed to support the work described in a proposal. You should also understand that as it is your own best estimate, the funder also often has an idea of what those estimates are. So as you're doing your budget, make sure that those estimates are realistic enough so the, bond that, the funder doesn't look at you as if you are trying to do something that is not real. So again, it's an estimate. You know the estimate, but the funder will also know the estimate or they can check on what the estimate is. Uh, budgeting is part of uh, financial management and every funder wants to support organizations that can manage finances. Money is not given to you because a funder likes you, I think I said that in the last time, they give you resources to do a project because they trust that you can be able to manage that funds very responsibly. So, uh, you know, budgeting well is a good part of your financial management and financial management means that you plan, you organize, you control and you monitor the financial resources that you have received to enable you meet those objectives. Uh, okay, I'm going to look at a small financial management, uh, what is called a financial management circle here. And again, you should always keep that in mind when you start working on your budget. First of all, you plan very aggressively. Doing your budget, you must always make a plan. Budget is not something that you do at the last moment. You plan that as you begin to write your proposal. And then when you plan it, you can be able to do the necessary research that you need to make sure that your budget is realistic. After you've planned and you've set your budget, you move to the next step, which is to implement your project. If you plan well, the implement, implementation stage often goes very smoothly. It's like, again, if you are a video producer, if you have a pre-production process, that is very thorough. If you're a filmmaker, you pre-produce well, you do your location scouts, you do everything well, then when it's time to actually shoot, everything goes smooth. But if you don't plan very well, then you realize that you are often stuck and having too many issues. So if you plan your budget well, the implementation stage will often go very well. Then finally, after you've implemented, you review. Review is where you monitor and report back to the funder on the project that they funded. So this is what we call the financial management circle and every creative which you know how to plan appropriately. Plan your work, plan your budget, plan your activities. Because if you those that do not plan are doomed to fail. That's one thing I want you to, to kind of get away from this. So now when you create your budget, there are certain considerations that you should always have in mind. The first one, are what are your organizational expenses? Many people do budgets for projects without thinking about the organization. Where you are, you pay rent for the space you are. So if ANF is supporting you to do a short documentary, you need to remember that you pay rent and build that into your budget. 
because that is part of what it takes for you to be able to do your job. So always remember your organizational expenses as you do budget. Many people make the mistake of only looking at the project budget. Next thing is you should always think of the donor expectations. When you are working on a budget, understand what the donor wants. Some donors want you to do detailed budgets. Some want you to do five or seven line item budgets. Some donors want you to save your receipts. Others don't want you to do that. So engage your program officer within the donor agency and have a full understanding of what the expectations are for you to submit information to them uh, when you're asking for the resources and for you to also submit information when you finished your project. Next thing you also consider is your organizational sustainability. Build into your budget the ability that allows you to be sustainable. If you are an individual creative, Let's say you don't work for an organization, you are an independent producer. You need to pay yourself a salary. That's part of sustainability. You cannot continue doing your work if you are putting all the resources into projects. So building that sustainability into the budget and also explain that to the funder. Many funders understand that creatives also have other responsibilities. They have to eat, they have to pay school fees for their children, they have to do all the other things. So do not be shy to build that into your project budget, or your budget, overall budget, provided that you explain that process to the donor. And then finally, you have your project activities. Those are that particular project that the resources will go to pay for, uh, what are your project activities? So all four of these, are part of what make your budget. And you should always consider them and make sure that they're well accommodate, accommodated for as you begin to create your budget. When you do a budget and a funder sees it, there's a lot of things the budget tells the funder about your organization. It tells them about how transparently you run your organization. If you are not willing to divulge certain information that a funder needs, then that funder will know that you are not willing to be transparent. For example, they say, you know, how much money did you get last year when they want to see your capacity to handle funds and you're not able to tell them that very easily, then they know that you're not transparent. A budget allows a funder to know what value you have for money. A funder is not going to give you money that you, are, that you don't have any value for, that you're going to just spend without considering uh, what you're spending that money for. So for example, if you have to fly uh, from Johannesburg to Pretoria, uh, sorry, from Johannesburg to Cape Town to do the project, and you are putting in your budget a flight ticket, that's understandable. No funder expects you to drive from Johannesburg to Cape Town. But if you now put a first class flight ticket in that budget, it means you don't have value for the money because you and I know that if you're spending it with your own money, you're not gonna fly first class. On the other case now, if you're going from Johannesburg to Pretoria, a funder that knows where Pretoria is will know that you go by road or you go by hard train for those of you in South Africa, you don't go, you're not gonna put a flight ticket for that. So you look at, the value for money and how you do your budgeting enables the funder to know how much you value their money. The budget tells a funder about your capacity to handle funds. If you are a small organization and the first grant you apply for is a $500,000 grant, I, as a funder, will look at your ability to be able to handle those funds. What is your capacity to handle those funds? So be realistic about what you apply for. Even as we look at ANF, ANF gives, I think, maximum of $25,000 grants. If you haven't received resources before, you might have an amazing idea that that $25,000 will go to. But I advise you, if you haven't received anything before, start with the KKRA grants, which are the small grants that they do. Then prove yourself, improve your capacity, and then you can now go for bigger grants. Many people make the mistake of their first approach and looking for funding is going for the big, big uh, hits. 
that's not a good way. You need to have the capacity to handle what the funder gives you. A budget also tells the funder how competitive you are. Again, remember that you are not the only one approaching a funder for projects. If you know, uh, a funder wants to fund a series of short films, they will get proposals from different content creators. They will look at it and they will understand, okay, how much does it cost to create a short film? As someone that funded films for so long, I had an idea of what it would take to fund a film. Now, obviously that differs based on what the film, what's involved with the production, but I had a very good idea. So when someone comes to me and if a film that I think $50,000 can be able to do, and they want me to give them $200,000, they are not competitive enough. And I'm not going to look at them. I look at someone that fits into that range that I believe is competitive to get the project done. And then a budget tells me as a funder, whether you are able to follow guidelines. Following guidelines is very important and very critical because if you cannot follow guidelines to actually present a budget to me or present your proposal to me, how am I sure that you're going to be able to follow guidelines when it comes to doing the project? So again, these detailed, these detailed submissions that you do enable the funder to understand your ability to follow guidelines. And we creatives actually have a bad rap because a lot of people feel like creatives might not be the best at following guidelines because of the fact that we are creative. We like to you know, color outside the lines. But when it comes to a funder trying to support you, that funder wants people that can stay within the lines and stay within the parameters of what that funder can be able to do and to support. So it's always good that these are kind of what I, as a funder, will be looking at when I see your budget that you submit for your projects. The type of cost you should always include in your budget. Obviously, you have your operational or project costs, which are the costs that are going to pay for the project you are going to be working on. That's very important. You have your staff costs. Again, I've mentioned earlier on about, you know, within the project, you can build in staff costs within the project. Some funders want you to keep staff costs separately. And again, that is because you want to make sure that you are not using all the money to pay staff salaries and let's go into the project. So when I was with the Ford Foundation, there was a guideline in the Ford Foundation that for every project grant that we give, not more than 30% of that grant will go towards paying salaries. That was a guideline. Now, oftentimes some things might happen that that can change. But that variation is often not too much. So that's always the guideline that we use. So always think of your, your, your staff cost. Think about the core cost. The core cost are the core activities that enable you to be able to sustain your project. You know, if you have a car, you pay fuel for the car, you pay electric, uh, you, you buy um, power units. Those things might not be built into your project, but they are part of what enables you to do that project. So you always, uh, again, accommodate that in your budget. You think about sustainability. Sustainability is about your long-term ability to survive. If you finish each project, and then at the end of that project, everything ends there, and you don't have what is next, then you're gonna close shop. Now, it's always good to build in sustainability and again, let the funder know. Some funders are able to say, no, we can't fund this part of your, your project. And you understand that. But many funders want you to be there. Funders don't want you to close after each project. So when you build in sustainability cost, it could be money for rent. It could be, as I've indicated, money to maintain cars, money to pay for power, money to pay for internet. Build that in as part of your organizational sustainability and have that in your budget. Capital cost is often a very tricky one because many funders, especially American foundations, find it very difficult to do capital cost because again, most American foundations go through American tax laws. Again, when I was with the Ford Foundation, Ford Foundation did not like to support capital expenditures because the IRS rule says that you have to depreciate those expenditures over a seven year period. So if I give you money to buy a camera to do a documentary, 
that camera has to be depreciated over seven years before it becomes zero value. So it means that you are going to be submitting a report every year for that seven years. Now, when the project has finished and I did not give you money the next time, you lose motivation to submit those reports. So oftentimes, capital costs are things that let people that lead foundations have grants that cannot be closed because people are no longer producing reports. They're not getting money anymore and it creates a problem. So capital costs are often a little uh, difficult thing to do. Now, one of the things that I, that I did, which again, many funders can do, is you have a conversation with your program officer. Your program officer is your biggest ally to this whole process. Let them know that, okay, you need to rent a camera for 15 days at $200 a day, that gives you $3,000. With that $3,000, you can be able to buy a camera that enables you to do this work. And after the work is done, you can keep that camera. Be upfront with them. And most of the time they will say, fine, you can do that, but you don't report on it. You still report on renting this, but again, you can do. So a, a, a few times we've been able to do that because again, Fonda is interested in your sustainability. And then finally, always put in contingency costs. As I said earlier on, a budget is an estimate. Contingency are those things that you did not plan for. And most of us that work in the continent know that we are a continent of contingency. There are a lot of things that will come up that you did not plan for. So always accommodate for it so you don't wind up being at the losing end at the end of your project. Okay, next. Uh, in part of your, as you build your budget, there are other things that you should always try to add on as much as possible that again shows you, uh, you know, your additional resources that you bring to the projects. In kind contributions, as a producer, as a creative, we do a lot of favor for others. So I might be doing a film and I get a director of photography, which I cannot afford to pay. Maybe her rate is $200 a day and I can only afford to pay her $50. And because the person is a friend of mine, they, saw, they say fine. Part of your in-kind contributions that you can report to a funder is to report that whole $200. Even if you're not paying it, there's a value to that donation that that person has made to cut their rate from $200 to $50. So report that as part of what you're bringing to the project. A funder will often look better on you if you are bringing something into the relationship, not when you are expecting them to fund everything 100%. Obviously, your own part of what you bring doesn't always have to be cash. It can be other things like these in-kind contributions. You have tax incentives. If you are shooting something in, in Kenya, for example, and uh, you're shooting at a place in Nairobi that government normally has to put, ask you to pay taxes for, and because you're doing a special project, they say, okay, we won't make you pay these taxes to access this location. That is something you can report as part of, again, what you're bringing in because it's value that you are bringing into the projects. You have pre-sales. If you have a project that you are doing and you've already negotiated with someone that they're going to pay you when the project is done, that's a pre-sale. You report that, again, because that should let the funder know that there is some value to that work and there's some value that you're bringing. If you have fiscal sponsorships that you might not have concluded, but you are expecting, again, expectation, there's two things about expectation. There are guaranteed expectations and then promised expectations. Don't report on a promise that your uncle gave you that they are going to sponsor you from their own personal company. That's a promise. But if uh, Nigerian Breweries Limited has a fiscal sponsorship with you, say we're going to support you and you've negotiated that with them and they're now going through the process of getting those resources, then you can report that because that is almost like a guarantee. So always understand that when you're reporting fiscal sponsorship, don't report those ones that you are not sure you are going to get and report those ones that you're certain that they will come in. Finally, product placement. If you have negotiated, and uh, for example, placing some logos, placing some things as part of your production that you're promoting for someone, that's a value to that. 
report that again as some of the additional resources that you're bringing into the project. The whole idea of this is that as you do your budget, the, you should be able to let the funder know that there is some additional value that you're bringing in that goes outside of the resources that they are giving you. Again, because if the project is important enough to you, you should bring a few things onto the table also. Now I'm gonna end by giving you a couple of uh, like lists. So these are almost like your top 10 lists, I guess, but some of them are more than 10. Never leave your budgeting issues to the end. Budgeting should start at the beginning of your thinking about your projects. When you leave things to the end, you make mistakes. So as you plan your project, start your budget at that point. Make sure you have the correct numbers as you do your budgeting. There's nothing that makes you look as unprofessional as giving wrong numbers. When you do a budget, choose a format and be consistent. If you're gonna do a budget on Excel, do on Excel and consistently use that Excel flow for it. Don't do one, one on Excel for a particular part of the project, then move over to using Microsoft Word tables for the next part of that. Consistency, both in your presentation and both in the way that you put your things, even the way that you, that you indicate. For example, if you're paying people by the day, there has to be a consistent format on how you're doing amount, day, how many days, and the total. A budget has to be consistent so someone can be able to look at it and, and read it through very quickly. Check your math multiple times. If you cannot calculate as you're trying to ask me to give you money, how am I convinced that you can calculate when it's time for you to tell me how much you spent the money? So always make sure that you check your math, use your calculator. Some of you are math wizards, but double check. Use your calculator, use whatever you can to work this. I love Excel for budgets. When I use Excel to do budgets, I can use the Excel calculation algorithm to be able to do my totals. That works most of the time. Be realistic in the way you do your budgeting. Again, realistic, being realistic means putting things at the cost that they are. Be exhaustive, put everything in your budget. It's always a lot easier to remove than to add in a budget. So err on the side of caution. Engage your team in budgeting and budget reporting. One mistake many organizations make is that the founder or the CEO wants to manage all the budget issues so they don't, so people that work with him or her don't know how much money is coming in. That is wrong. When I was in the Ford Foundation, I had instances where resources were given to someone and in those resources, there was money that was indicated to pay certain parts of, of staff. And then I run into those staff and they're not telling me how much they're getting. It's like less than half of what they're supposed to get. In those instances, I mean, I'm not gonna fund that organization again because I can't trust them. So engage your team in budgeting and budget, work with them, talk to them when the money comes in and then make sure that everybody is on the same line. Inflation and exchange rate fluctuations are real. Again, this is very, very important for us in the environment that we exist in. Exchange rate changes from day to day. What exchange rate are you going to use? I know my, my, my colleague Kathy is gonna talk a little bit more about this, but always keep that in mind that your exchange rate is going to fluctuate as much as possible. So accommodate that when you also do your reporting. Explain extraordinary costs. If that basically means a cost that does seem to be realistic. I have a, a good example. We funded and Ford Foundation a group that was working in Medugri, Boronu State during, during uh, uh, the Boko Haram issue. And their hotel that they were giving us was the most expensive hotel in Medugri. Now, under normal circumstances, that is wrong, but they did explain that because of where they are working, this is the hotel that provides the best security for them. And when they explain that, obviously I don't want them to go to a cheaper hotel to put themselves at risk. I was able to say, that's fine. You can spend that amount of money in this particular hotel because that is where you're going to be the safest to do the project. Finally, have an extra eye 
look over before you submit. When you are working on proposals and budgets and everything, you hyper-focus on it. And when you hyper-focus, you no longer see the errors and the mistakes and the challenges. So always give it to somebody else to take a look at for you before you submit. Top 10 reasons to take your budget seriously. It makes you accountable to the people who give you money. It makes you accountable to your community. Always remember that you are representing a community. Whatever you do, most founders do not understand the community that we, you come from as a creative. If one person goes in there and does something that is wrong, it affects how that founder deals with all other members of that community. So you are also accountable to make sure that that community is well represented. Budgeting makes it possible for you to produce financial documents to regulators when they come asking for it. Budgeting allows you to minimize fraud and abuse of resources. Budgeting allows you to plan for the future, for the future of yourself and your organization and become more financially secure. It allows you and your staff to make better decisions on use of funds. If you don't have a budget and money is just given out, then how those funds are used are not going to be well accounted for. Budgets help you achieve objects of your organization and objectives of your project. They help you to enhance your credibility. Again, it goes back to those, those issues of how you are seen and how credible you are and how that affects everything else around you. It helps to strengthen the organization and it helps you and the donor to get better value for the resources that they are giving to you. A donor, a donor again, wants to give money to the organization or the individual that will give them the best value for the resources. And the way they can know that is by looking at a budget that is well thought through, a budget that is well presented, a budget that is very realistic. I want to end by putting a quote that I love. It is a quote by James Cameron, a, a, an American filmmaker. And he said, pick up a camera, shoot something, no matter how small, no matter how cheesy, no matter whether your friends and your sister star in it, put your name on it as director. Now you are a director. Everything after that, you're just negotiating your budget and your fee. I put this here as an encouragement. I know a lot of times it's difficult to go through all this capacity building. You're always learning, 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 but you haven't created. That's good, but also it's good to create because once you create, you are at a better position to now start negotiating your budget, to start negotiating your fee, to start negotiating your credibility. So even if you don't have a budget, find a way to create because creating makes it possible for someone to believe in your ability and to invest in you. Thank you very much. I look forward to the questions that you're going to ask and I'm going to hand it back to, uh, I believe I hand it back to Mark and I'm going to start sharing my screen. Yeah, thank you. thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciate this. You did very good with the time, um, right on time. Thank you so much. You touched on a lot of areas that creatives have found quite confusing over time. Um, and sometimes it's a bit difficult to arrive at a consensus at things like contingency and whether organizations that give grants would accept you, including contingency in your budgets. I know you touched on that a little bit and I've seen a couple of comments around that, that, that subject as well. So I'm sure you know that's a, one question you should expect um, when we come to the Q&A. Um, I love the point you made about the 30% grant 30% of grants, which um, is allowable for overheads and, and, and staff of the project. And so um, I've seen a couple of questions and comments around that as well. So that's something to prepare. I'm sure um, you will do justice to that and the Q&A session. And so um, I would just like to urge you to keep putting your questions in the uh, Q&A function. Um, I apologize for those who couldn't see Paul's slides. I, I saw a few comments that some people couldn't see your slides. I apologize for that. I don't know what happened. Maybe it's the network on your end, um, but I'm sure um, we are going to make efforts to share the slides um, right after this event. So please don't be, don't be alarmed. 
you will get the slides after this event. Um, we will proceed with the next presenter. Our next presenter is Kati Qatar. She's an experienced grant manager and financial expert. She joined the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture in 2012 and has been responsible for grant management at the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture. She completed her studies in economics and worked as the financial coordinator at ASSABIL, which is simply Friends of Public Libraries Association, a non-governmental organization established in 1997 to, to establish and promote public libraries in Lebanon. And she has been an active member of this association. She will be presenting on financial management and reporting over the next 20 minutes. And so, Cathy, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to participate in this webinar. And thank you, Paul, for the, thank you, Victor. <laughs> thank you, Paul, for the very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I'll be talking about the reporting. This is uh, what I do. Uh, I work with AFRA as a grants manager. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen. I work with AFAQ. AFAQ is a regional institution that works in Lebanon, but that supports artists, Arab artists in the Arab region and, in the, and outside the Arab region. And what I do is I do the follow-up the grants management and follow up with the grantees since they start by working on their project till the end. Uh, and I will start by the pre-reporting phase. Uh, as actually Paul said, a good, uh, what is really what is for me really important to know is that a good report should would start with a good proposed budget. If you have a budget that is not really consistent, that is not comprehensive, that does not cover all your expenses, you will have a lot of problems later on with your reporting. So when you are working on the proposal, when you're proposing a project, even when you are thinking your your project, your idea, what you want to do, and writing it down as a, as a narrative report, you should really think about how this is going to be reflected in the budget. A good budget should first reflect your proposal and also should should show to the donor who is who don't know you, who don't know your project, who just trying to discover what you want to do from this paper that, that you have in his hand, what you are what you want to do and you, how you are going to do. So try to have a, a proposed budget that is very exhaustive, even if you're not asking for the total budget from your donor, it's always very important to have a, a very, an exhaustive budget with all, the, with all the expenses, with all the phases of your project, how you are going to do what you are doing, phase one, phase two, what are the outcomes, how are you going to communicate about your project, all of these are expenses. And all these expenses you should consider at first, you should have them all to know exactly what you need to, to implement your project and to do it as you want to do it. And when you have all those expenses in one sheet, and like Paul said, Excel might be the best and the easiest way to do a budget. You can have all the rows, you can have as much columns as you want, and you have, uh, you, have, you can use Excel formulas to have the total. You don't have, you, it's not that uh, you're doing the calculation by yourself, it's a system. You, you minimize the, 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 the math problems and minimize losing one of your expenses. So have it all on one Excel sheet clear, and then you will decide what you will ask for, what you will ask your donor to cover or not to cover. And moving to, to your donor, what's very important is to know what are the guidelines and what your donor will accept to cover and what he will not accept to cover. Some ex for you know, the donors, you don't, you, don't, you don't communicate actually with one donor. You have multiple donors, you have individual donors, you have institutional donors. So for some, some expenses are eligible, for others are not. Some, some donor will accept to give you salary, others won't. Some will give you the 30% of your institution, of the grant will go to your institutional cost or your salaries. Some will tell you it's only 10% that you can allocate on the budget. 
some will allow you to buy a book others won't. Some will allow you to do, uh, I don't know, campaigns to your project or to your institution. So you should always read the guidelines before submitting. If you read the guideline and you think that something is not clear, you can just send an email to your donor and ask, is this eligible or this is not? Because it's very, it's very frustrating that, you sub, for example, that you submit an application and a budget and you will find out later that they will not, uh, will not cover these expenses. So please make sure to read the guidelines, to check them, to know what you can ask for and what you cannot ask for. The artist fees, the salaries are a very big question, actually, because uh, yeah, you need to have your fees as an artist, you need to have the fees as an institution, and you need to have salaries for your employees. This is how you are sustainable. This is how you can continue to work even when the project is, is finished and closed. So you have to check all of these questions before submitting to your, your before submitting the project. Once this is submitted, once you receive the grant, the second phase will start. It's you have the grant, you have the money, you have the amount that you requested for, and you need to implement your project. Before starting to implement, also you need to communicate and to know what you will be asked to submit after you have your, uh, after, at the end with the reporting. So you, so you should ask your donor what you have to, uh, to submit. Will they ask you for invoices, for receipts, for contracts, for invoices and receipts? Should you then send them the scans of these uh, documents or should you send them the original one? Because this is, what, if you know that from the beginning, you can start from day one to scan the invoices or save them in hard copies and you know that you will mail them later. But if you come like in one year at the end, and you want to do the report and you have lost many of these invoices or many of these receipts, it will be a big problem and you might lose the second payment, the third payment, or maybe you will receive your money now, but you will lose a good relationship with your donor. So this is very important to know what you need to submit. In some countries, uh, yeah, I mean, in this part of the world, it's not always easy to have uh, official invoices. Sometimes we have non-official invoices. Sometimes we'll buy things from a shop and they will just give us a small receipt signed by hand. Will your donor accept this or no? You should know that from the beginning. Because if, he, if the donor will not accept, so you have to find another provider to buy the things or another service provider to go to. Uh, if he accepts, or maybe he have alternatives, he will tell you, you can have uh, your own receipts, for example. So all this, all, also you need to check this with the donor from the beginning to know what to expect and what to collect and how to collect it. Uh, other than the invoices and all the, and the, the supporting material that you should uh, offer to your donor, there's also one very, very, yeah, very important thing to consider that when you submit your budget at the beginning, it's an estimation. You will try your best to have uh, the best estimation possible. You have the prices, you have what you think you need. But once you start your implementation, it's very hard to keep the same amount. So you will, for, for some budget lines, you will exceed them. For other, it will be under budget. So how to deal with this? Will your donor accept that you make changes from one budget line to another? How are you going to make these, uh, these changes? Do you need to ask for, for example, a change in the budget? Do you have the right to make some, uh, like shift from one budget line to another without requesting this, uh, this change in the, in the budget lines? You have to know this also from the beginning because this will help you in managing your own budget and will reduce any problems later on with your report. Uh, another very important issue is the exchange rate. Usually you receive, you will receive the grant in, in dollars, in euros, in international currencies, but most of your expenses will be done in the local currency. So exchange rates, first of all, they will change, they will fluctuate, they will not stay the same, and that's, this will affect, have, will affect all your budget. This is a problem that you have to manage and you have to consider. Another very important point for me also is, are we always using the official rate or are we using the black market? 
I mean, we know that in a lot of our countries, we have the official rate and the market rate. And if you use the official rate, you will lose like maybe 10%, 50%, even more of your grant. So how are you going to, to, to deal with this? Will your donor accept it or he will not accept it? Some donors are very strict, let's say, and they will tell you everything should be done at the exchange rate, at the official exchange rate, and we will not accept any change other than that. And we need a statement from your know, international the, or the bank, the official bank of the country with the rates, and we will not accept any change in that. So you have to deal with this from the beginning. Other donors will be more flexible. They will tell you we will accept the black market, but this is how you are going to report for us, report it to us. So this is one problem that that will occur in more most of our of our reporting and managing grants. So you need to check this from the beginning. Also, I suggest that this is very important. And for example, I do this. With with most of my grantees, even especially in the countries where I know that they have this problem, it will be a, a very clear and uh, simple discussion. How are you going to, to pay? Are you going to use this grant? This, the official rate, are you going to pay in dollars or in euros? Are you going to pay in local currency? I don't know, us as an institution, we are very flexible in this. This is not the case all the time. So you, you need to check with your donor about this post. Uh, another very important thing for the reporting is to always keep in mind that you have dates and you have deadlines, and you need to respect the deadline. It's it's not yeah, it's not very well seen that you, you do not re reply on date that you extend make extension you don't send your reports on time you like to uh, disappear for a couple of months and then come back it's not very well seen by your donors. So always have on your calendar the deadlines and always estimate how much you will need time also to do the narrative report, but also to do the financial report and what are the requirements, what are the documents that you need. Do you need to ask for a bank statement from your bank? Do you need to have, I don't know, any other requirement that you need contracts from your service providers? Always keep it in mind that you have a deadline and you need to expect it. And what can facilitate your life actually is to ask for the templates of reports from the beginning. Most of the donors do have their own templates and they will ask you to use it. And when you have the templates from the beginning, that means that you have, or you can already start by collecting the good information from the beginning when they ask you for the date of your, of your invoice, for the number of your invoice, uh, for any additional description. If you know that from the beginning, that will help you throughout the implementation. Uh, some tips for a good reporting is to always keep track of all your expenses. Yani even if it's one dollar, even it's less than one dollar, even if it's a small, uh, I don't know, about a bottle of water, you have to need to put it on the budget. You might forget it in, in two weeks. So. Always, always keep track of all your expenses. You can have your own notebook or you can have your Excel, you can do it officially, or you can have a small, like you write it down and later on when you go to the office or to your home, you can uh, yeah, yeah, list it in a very, in the way it should, but always keep track of the invoice of expenses. Always keep all your invoices with you, scan them. You can have like, uh, you know, the, those scan scanner that you have on your, uh, on your cell phone. You can just make a screenshot and you can keep, yeah, they are at least kept. Uh, always respect also the budget lines because when you submitted a proposal and it was accepted, it was accepted because of the idea of the proposed project, but it was also accepted based on your budget. And, uh, based on the budget lines and how the budget is divided. 20% for the fees, 25% for the communication, 10% for the publication, whatever. So you have to respect the budget lines if you need to, do not, if you have to make changes from the budget lines, you need also to check with, uh, with your donor. Uh, one thing that I find very, 
I really appreciate when I receive, for example, a, grant, uh, a report and I have the scan, the invoices or receipt well organized in different folders because your, uh, your donor or the officer that is following on your grant, he has your grant, but he has other, maybe 100 other projects that he's following. It's very hard to be, to receive like one big folder with 100 invoice and as a, as a grants manager, I have to follow up and to see where, what what's it, what this expenses is and when where I should put it. Especially that you are you may have like invoices in your local language and your donor will not know your language, so it you will make his life a little bit difficult. So it's very it's really very nice to have a very well organized folder sent. Your your donor will appreciate that. It will create a very good relationship between the both of you. And finally, what can be sometimes very important is to have a narrative explanation for the expenses. I know that when we think of, a, of a financial reporting, we think that we just need to have the amounts and maybe the number of the scan uh, and, and salary. But sometimes it is not enough. You donor need to know what this, what this expenses is really for using Excel or any other document and just add some information about this. This is how we pay $10 for per hour for this kind of expenses. We had to buy this uh, tripod because we lost our first tripod. Whatever you need to do, add some explanation that will help the one following on your uh, that is uh, reviewing your report that will reduce the back and forth of email and questions and will facilitate all the process. Uh, I usually, I, I added this simple table, whatever the donor have a template to use, maybe you can find your, if you find the reporting template of your donor a little bit complicated and to facilitate your life, just do a very simple format that you can, that you feel familiar with, you feel comfortable in using. For example, for me, I added the, I always ask for the very simple things like budget items in the contract and the budget and what are the expenses. This is a, uh, an example. You can have other expenses, examples or templates. Just find the template that suits you and you feel comfortable in. And finally, always communicate with your donor. That's a very, very important thing. If you need to do any changes in your budget, in your outcomes, in the date of your uh, of, of your implementation plan, whatever you have to do, what you have, you may you may have some challenge, obstacle. I don't know. We had lockdown, and suddenly you can't do what you intend to do. You have a crisis, an economic crisis in the country, and you can't do what you have to do. You I don't know. You are sick, and you have to stop working for a, one month. So always communicate with your donor. Tell them what you have. Or sometimes you can just share with them a success story that happened. So they donors are, I mean, you always see the donor behind the scene and they're the one who have the money and you need them, but they also need you because this is how uh, it works. For artists or uh, individuals or apply for grants, but institutions are interested in finding a very good project that they would like to support. So always communicate with them, always discuss with them. Sometimes they might be, you will not expect that they will be flexible, but they can be. And if they're not flexible, if they cannot accept, better to know that you cannot do what you would like to do before doing it and facing problems at the end. But also, and you never forget that this is your problem, your project, sorry, and you need to keep ownership of your, pro of your project. So you can communicate with your donor, but you should not expect him to give you all the answers. It's your project. He have a lot of, he will be happy to support, you, but he also cannot receive one email per day from you. So you have to find this balance of where you can communicate with your donors what's happening if you make any changes, but in the same time, expect that he will not do the follow-up, the daily follow-up. So it's very important to, to keep this balance between a very professional but friendly relationship. Do not expect more that you have you need to and do not all, also ignore your donor at the end. So that's it. I think it was a little bit quick, but I hope I managed to cover everything I needed to. Thank you. 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 Thank
Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. I hope you can all hear me clearly. I had a bit of issue with my connection, but I guess it's, it's okay now. Um, thank you so much, Kathy and Paul. It's been very exciting, very informative listening to you both. And um, the chat box and the Q&A section, it's been a beehive of comments and questions, and there's a whole lot there. We've got a few more minutes, um, say in the next 25 minutes or so. I hope that we can go through as many questions as possible um, from the Q&A box. Um, if you can hear me clearly, uh, Paul and Kathy, you appear frozen on my screen. I want to be sure you can hear me before I start asking the questions. I can hear you. Okay, beautiful. Um, like I did suspect, we've got a question here, Paul, on how um, you could tell the difference between small and big funding. I know you said a couple of things that should be considered when you're designing your budgets and when you're doing some considerations, you know, and some of those considerations differ from small funds or small grants to big grants and what kind of things you should include as your budget line items and budget components and so on. So I think the question here is about what do you see or what do you classify as small grants or small funding and what do you classify as big funding in the industry? Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks, Victor. And thanks, Cathy, for, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, on this question, I think that's the definition that is often made based on the funder. Some funders will have, you know, $5,000 as, as a small grant. Others will have it as a big grant. So it really depends on the funder and the capacity of the funder. Okay, if I look at ANF, ANF, I think the maximum grants that are given are $25,000. I believe that's for organizational grants. That's a big fund. But if you go to, you know, an Open Society Foundation, or even like, okay, when I was in the Ford Foundation, the Ford Foundation had this policy that anything below $50,000 is a small grant. That has actually now been raised to $100,000. When I was there, it used to be $50,000. Now it's gone to $100,000. And that, that was seen as a small grant. Anything above that is a big grant. So really, that definition is set by the funders. But you also, as an organization, need to know, as I, I talked about capacity, you also need to understand what is your capacity to handle funds. If you haven't been used to receiving funds, then you go for the smallest fund that you can receive to build your history of receiving funds before you now go for bigger resources. Thank you, Paul. Um, that was quite clear. There's another question quite similar to that. You know, somebody applied for a grant and the funding was quite limited. Uh, the person didn't indicate how much exactly, but it appears like it falls under the category of small funds. And the person is asking if it's okay to still include you know, rent and some of those things you said can be considered under contingency and so on, and um, organizational sustainability considerations. If to have those, if you have those kind of small grants being applied for, can you go ahead to, to include that in your budget, or do you just focus on the project costs? Uh, again, and, uh, that's a very good question, but also a very difficult question to answer, because if you are, for example, applying for a $2,000 grant that you want to use to do a photo exhibition. Yeah, you know, you should be able to look at everything that costs in doing that exhibition, and that should be your project. Now, is it realistic for you to start adding, you know, let's say you, you have an office and your office, uh, your office rent is that same $2,000. You have to ask yourself that question. Is it worth it for me to now double that grant by adding my office cost or to say, okay, I'm going to add 5% of my office cost to that uh, grant? What benefit does it do to you to get 5% versus getting the grant? So those are things that you have to actually sit down and make that decision. Yes, it's always good to do sustainability, but if that is going to stop you from getting that grant, then work on getting the grant first. That's always been, you know, let us be realistic. It's always good to say, okay, if I'm applying for a small grant, I want to build everything in India. But when I start building things in, if it makes it difficult for me not to be able to get the grant, then it's best for me to remove those things, get the grant, deliver on the project, build my history of getting things done. 
Because if it's the smaller grants that you get, multiple of them, that makes it possible for you to start applying for bigger grants. Even if you have to now sacrifice in the beginning and not add those sustainability factors that, you know, it's good to add. But like I said, if it's going to negatively affect your getting the grant, my advice is to leave them alone till the big one comes. Beautiful. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Cathy. Yes, I want just also to suggest one thing. When you are applying for small grants, maybe you should, it's good also to have in mind that you can apply for different donors, not with the same lines, but with the same project. So you might receive a small grant from this donor and another small grant from the, and this will facilitate in having a bigger amount instead of just focusing on one grant on one donor. And even if you are uh, established artists or institutions and you are aiming to submit like for one big institution with a big grant, sometimes it's always, it's better also to, to keep in mind that you can also uh, apply for small grants from here and there and this will help you in managing better your budget. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thanks a lot, Cathy and Paul. Um, there's a related question here. And Cathy, I think I'll be interested in hearing from you. Yeah, you know, if AFAC, the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture, accepts contingency in, uh, in the budget of applicants, um, if, if it's allowable to include contingency costs, because the person is asking, you know, um, what's the benchmark? What should be the allocation to contingency from your budget? Is it 30%, is it 20%, is it 10%? What factors could determine how you allocate contingency costs and what size of your budget should be allocated to contingency costs? Yeah, it's not, no, it's usually around 10% because we accept that uh, applicants apply with their own fees for around 30%. And in the last two years, due to the situation, we accepted that this, uh, percentage was raised to 50%. So with the 50%, we reduce the contingency cost expenses, but normally we accept up to 10%. But yeah, 10% in, addition, in addition to the artist's fees or in addition to 30% for institutions, and in this 30%, they can have salaries, rent, and all the different expenses. Oh, beautiful. Paul, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I want to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I know I use the term contingency, and contingency is a term that many funders don't like to see. There is a more palatable term that we use called indirect costs. Indirect costs will cover almost everything a contingency will cover, but again, it's more acceptable. You can do two types of indirect costs. There is what is known as indirect costs for the larger organizational sustainability. So for example, now you don't even have to start building in your rent. You can do an indirect cost, which applies to all those other things. And then you can also do what is called an indirect cost that is directly attributable to the project. Mm. So you have you know, a larger one and then one that goes to the project and that is where that will fall under. Now, again, many funders have a policy on how much of that they can fund. Some can do 10%, some can do 20%. So, but that is the term that is more acceptable than contingency. Okay, thank you so much. Um, there's a question here about assuming renting a camera costs like $5,000, for example, but purchasing a camera also costs around the same amount or just slightly different. Is it possible that you create a budget and include purchasing a camera rather than hiring the camera because of the close costs? Paul, what do you think about that? Yeah, if uh, I mean, if the funder is able to comfortably fund capital costs, then yes, you do that. You put that on your budget. Now, if you know some funders, like I explained earlier don't like to do capital fund because of the reporting responsibilities that many, many grantees often don't abide by it. In that instance, then you have a meeting with your program officer and present that case to them. You know, you can even get an invoice, say this camera will cost me this amount of money. And then if I'm to rent it, this is another invoice for renting it. I really, I want to buy this. More often than not, many programmers are gonna say, go ahead and buy it, but don't record it. Buy it and report it 
as renters. So long as those invoices are similar and the foundation or the funder is not being built, more often than not, the PO will always want you to do what will make you succeed. And being able to get that camera will make you succeed and survive for the longer term. So it's about communication. It's about sitting down and providing that evidence that says, okay, if I'm to rent this from XYZ Studio, this is the invoice, the performer invoice for that. If I'm to buy this, this is the performer invoice, I buy it to be helpful for me. So please, let's see how we can be able to work this out. And more often than not, they will work with you on that. All right, cool. Thank you so much. There's a question here, Paul and Cathy, about budgeting softwares. You know, not all funders um, put out a template, a budget template, or specify in very clear and precise terms what and what you should include in your budget and what you should not include in your budget. And so oftentimes, creatives find themselves having to use their discretion to decide based on knowledge and insight from exposures like this, you know, they just decide on what and what to include in the budget because it's not been clearly stated. Is there a budgeting software that you have ever come across that could help creatives, you know, fund their budgets, you know, in a way that is quite standard? I can't think of any software that I, I'm sure there are softwares out there. Uh, but, you know, again, what the funder is looking for is consistency. What I always advise is that you have two budgets. You have a short budget that doesn't give as much detail as possible. And then you create a longer budget that, that you know, itemizes everything. Submit the short one first. And if that is fine by the funder, they will accept it. If you ask for more, uh, uh, more details, then you submit the second one. Now, I've used Excel. Excel for me has always been a very good template to use for budgeting because it gives you that flexibility. I'm sure there are probably some specific software that has been built for content creators and for creative, but I can't think of any right on the top of my head at this point. Um, I actually, I, I agree because it's very difficult to have a very like, uh, fixed templates because expenses will vary from one artist, from one project to another. So it's very hard to have one very fixed template. And I also agree that Excel is, I mean, I saw different softwares and whatever, but I think Excel is just easy and friendly to use. And you can have, yeah, and even though what's Paul mentioning as a short budget and the long one, you can have like the original tab with the, uh, with the big budget lines and you have different tabs and they can be linked to your uh, main page. And it's not really difficult. It's, Yes. kind of easy to do it so you will have all the details per lines and different tabs and you have a summary at the beginning for me it's it's really the, the most friendly and easy to manage and you yeah. can always find someone to help you in excel it's not a, a very complicated uh, program yeah cool. yeah victor Thanks. sorry I also, I also want to add that you know i mean most funders also now have online platforms and a lot of times you are basically uploading what you've already created. So in that instance, you also stick with a very, a very more of the generic software. Because if you have a specific film making software that you've used to create your budget and you upload it, the funder might not be able to do it because they might not have that. But everybody yeah. has Excel. So yeah. you know, always as much as possible, stick to those more generic software when you have to upload you know, something that somebody will review. Oh, thank you so much. Paul, this question is directly to you. Um, Paul, could you share your advice on how to successfully bid for grants in cases where funders require you to have an annual set budget of X amount to qualify for funding? For example, how best do I apply for a 50,000 US dollars grant when my annual budget is around 40,000 US dollars? That's where it comes into looking at what other things are you bringing into that particular arrangement that is not cash. So if you know, I, I mentioned in-kind contributions, you can monetize in-kind contributions to help you look better. There's nothing wrong with that. People say that, you know, I'll be deceiving the funder. No, you're not, because there is a monetary value to those in-kind contributions. If you have a home office, you're a filmmaker, 
and you're working out of your home. There is a monetary value to that. Even when you're in America, when you do your taxes, you get a rebate for using your home as an office. So you start doing those calculations. So, you know, be, be realistic in saying, this is how much I'm getting. But also be realistic in saying, this is how much my value is. It's about the value that you bring to the project. And more often than not, when you can be able to document that value and say, you know, this is what it is and explain it, most funders will accept that. Oh, thank you so much. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would just like you to spend a couple of seconds to look through a poll. A poll must have appeared, a couple of questions must have appeared on your screen um, just a few seconds ago while Paul was answering that question. So please do take some time, um, a few seconds of your time to please uh, just put your answers there. It's quite simple, straightforward. It helps us design these uh, activities better and it helps us you know, gather the necessary feedback and insight that we need you know, to keep moving forward. So please do that, we will appreciate your responses and we will definitely work with your responses. Um, there's a question here, Paul and Cassie, a question about um, how to balance financial reporting and the social impact and success of an event. And so um, the question is around uh, how creatives can you know, provide some balance. The, the funders sometimes want you to show your figures, show how the $10,000 or $20,000 you got was spent, you know, and the creative is under the pressure of, not in the, of trying not to show that he or she ran at a loss or was not able to manage the funds effectively. You know, and sometimes they do this to the detriment of the overall success and the social impact and the kind of engagement that that project was supposed to achieve. You know, and so they're just railroaded and straight jacketed into, we must meet the financial reporting requirements of, of AFAC or of African No Filter or of, the, any of the, any of the big funders. And that's against how do we focus on making this project succeed, whether we are good with our numbers or we're not good their numbers. What do, you, what do you have to say about that balancing that creatives need to always think about? Well, I would say at the beginning, like failure is human. I mean, sometimes the, work, the project does not work or sometimes you don't have the impact. So we should always do our best to do the project. But if you, didn't, you don't have the impact, you don't need to, to exaggerate what you have. So the financial report is a financial report about what you had, how you expand how you spent what you received. And you should be clear um, about this. You spent it on this, and these are my invoices. And that, at least, even if you don't have, for me at least, for us at AFAC, even if you don't have the project that you wanted to achieve, at least you spend the money in a very clear way, in a very, uh, how to say, uh, you show how you spent it. You didn't, uh, there's no corruption. Transparency. Now we move to your project. What you have achieved, you can mention. And donors, when they read your report, they will they will feel that if you are exaggerating numbers. So you do. For me, you have a transparent financial report, and you do your best to have your project and to have the impact. Sometimes you have an impact on five people, and that's that's fair. You don't need to. I I don't like project when you say that I will have impact with ten thousand. I will impact the life of 200 child in my country or in my village. This is not also realistic. So for me, this is you have your financial report and you do your best to do your project. And that's the balance. This is how I see it. Okay, thank you so much, Kathy. Paul, do you want to add to that or can I go to the next question? No, I mean, I agree with Kathy. It's not every fund that is given that uh, always comes the way we planned it. Uh, so there are some you know, sometimes some unexpected things will make it difficult for for the recipient of a fund to not deliver on everything. So honesty is always the best in those instances. Uh, like Kathy has indicated, be honest and be transparent. And also, as you report, report on your learnings. It's not just about okay, yeah. this did not work. What did you learn from that experience, and how will that equip you in you know doing? The next time around, so you don't repeat those things. That's one thing I will add: is that you know, in those in those instances where it didn't work as planned, 
there are there are learnings that you should have gotten from that and you report on that so so the funder will also know that there was something benefit that did come out of the resources even though the project might not have turned out as a plan oh brilliant um we've got a question here about how to approach contingency in budgets still on that subject of contingency somebody's asking if i have a camera which is to be rented okay sorry if if i expect my camera rental to be 200 dollars per day is it okay and acceptable to add contingency on that particular line item and therefore present my camera rentals as $220 per day? Or will contingency be computed at the end of your budget? You apply a 10% contingency or a 20% contingency, or will you do this line item by line item? Okay, okay. In my, I always think it's better to do it overall. The challenge you do need line item by line item, like if, okay, let's look at the experience of a camera. If you are renting that camera and the person renting it to you says it's 200, they're gonna give you an invoice for $200. So if you now reported 220, when you've added your 10% contingency to the funder, and then the invoice that the funder is requesting, if they request that invoice shows 200, obviously you don't look good doing that. So it's always good to add it overall. And again, you know, don't just add contingency for the sake of contingency. Add it and explain that you're adding it. You know, don't just at the end of it say 10% contingency. No, you know, you indicate, you know, obviously projects go over a time period. There is what is called the time value of money. You know, things often increase. So in your narrative, you also indicate why it's necessary to do that. Uh, because, you know, Victor, you and I are in Nigeria, you know that what is, what is $1 today can be $1.20 by the time you wake up tomorrow morning. Yeah, that's right. And, and yeah, and then again, Cathy did mention about the fluctuating interest rate. Again, that, that is another big issue that many people have to be able to, 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 to look at. A, a lot of times, you know, it works in our benefits or the benefits of, of, the grant, of, the, of the grant recipient because the, inter, the exchange rate will always seem to be always going up. And especially if the funder enables you to be able to uh, exchange at a black market rate and then report at an official rate, which a lot of times, you know, many funders will do that. Again, you know, funders are not punitive. Funders don't want to punish you. But the issue is that, again, you have to do it in such a way that it does not expose the funder. And I will tell one story of that happening. I had a grantee in Lagos that you know, received funds in dollars. And uh, we understand that probably 80 to 90% of our grantees will go and change in the black market rate because the difference was quite significant. In this particular case now, the funder was changing black market rate and was exporting the money from the, the account of the organization to somebody outside of the country. Unfortunately, the person that received the money, the organization received the money had already been flagged by the FBI in America and for this an American organization. The recipient had been flagged as a potential terrorist organization. So money was now being moved from a fund, Ford Foundation funded project in Nigeria the terrorist potential terrorist group out of Nigeria. Mm. That report came to Ford Foundation in the US, who now referred it back to me here in Lagos. And I reached out to the organization and we talked about it. And they say, we don't know, we just that the banker, our accounts manager, we asked him to do this and we don't even know who, all we did was sign the papers. So even as you do this, you need to be careful. You need to make sure because there is a track, there is documentation that goes with all these things. So if you're even going to change black market rate, go and withdraw the money and go and change it. Don't be transferring yeah. it because you don't know who is going to be transferred yeah. to. And yeah. that created a challenge for that grantee organization. And also for me, because I had to write a big report explaining what happened. 
But what also that means is that now it's exposed me because they know that I'm supporting these grantees to do this exchange in the black market rather than the official rate. But again, you know, a lot of times we are not punitive. We don't want you to suffer. Do the project, report on what you've received because what we understand is the official exchange rate. That is what Ford Foundation uses when they calculate the resources that is spent out of this country. Beautiful point, Paul. Um, I, I guess it's just very important to understand that um, most of the funders, you know, especially when they're dealing with funds above a certain benchmark, they do their due diligence checks. Oh yeah, and trust me, most, they do that yeah, very well. Do, they are very yeah, so, careful about that. Yeah. Exactly. And so I think it'd be very good to reference some of the points that Cathy made during her presentation that there's a need for, you know, a very smooth communication, a flow of communication between yourself and you as a grant, grant, grantee and the grant maker or your project officer or whomever is the contact person in the organization issuing or offering you the grants. It's very important to have that line of communication watered and cultivated, you know, such that things like this, you, know, you can easily fall back on them and have conversations and get proper advice and guidance where needed. Um, there are a couple of questions. I doubt if I can take all the questions because we are uh, roughly five minutes or six minutes to the end of the session. Paul, there's a question which touched on something you said earlier about explaining that you are including contingency after you've drawn up your budget and you've added contingency. Don't just leave it there and expect that a grant, a grant, a grant maker would understand that you're adding contingency and there's a need to maybe drop a one or two lines there. Um, how much of narrative do you expect in the budget? I've come across some budgets where it starts with goal and mission and a whole lot of things that you don't expect to be in the budget. You expect those things to be in the proper application where they must have provided answers about the organization's goals and visions and objectives and so on. But then you see all of that in the budget and a lot of efforts of the, of the grantee trying to persuade who is looking at that budget. You know, so how much of of talk, how much of grammar, like we say in Nigeria, is needed in the budget? Um, or do we just deal with figures? Uh, you deal with figures in budget. The uh, grammar only comes in when you have to explain something that is extraordinary, like I said in my presentation. You know, if, if there is a particular cost that somebody will see and it doesn't look good, that's when you use narrative to explain it. But if everything is there, and there's no need to do that, then yeah, you don't need to, you, you, you focus on narratives on talking about your project. When it comes to your budget, focus on found on figures. Cool, thank you. Cathy, any word on that? No, I agree. I mean, you need to add uh, explanation when you have to, you don't have to add explanation for every budget line or for every expense, but sometimes it's really important to justify or to explain why you've made this, uh, this expenses or this change, but it's it should not be exhausted in writing. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. And also, Victor, I just want to add also part of what you should realize is that in a situation where a funder does an open call, the funder might get 5,000 applications for an open call. Somebody has to go through all that. And when you start, you know, when the funder, uh, the person reviewing that looks at what you have sent, and they were expecting three pages and you've sent 15 pages. Be realistic, no matter how good your idea is, they're already, their mind is already somehow against that project by looking at that 15 page. So you should, again, try as much as possible to provide information that is needed that will convince the funder, but be direct and straight to the point and as minimal as possible in consideration of those that are going to review those projects. Very true. Thank you so much, Paul and Kathy. We have just a few seconds more to the end. Um, there's just a question here that keeps popping up about, um, a question that keeps popping up about, about how some funders do not understand that there are some costs that cannot be invoiced, that there are some costs you cannot get receipts for. Kathy, do you want to respond to that very quickly before we close? Yeah, uh, no, we know that. So just you need to check with your donor how to express that how to how to write them or maybe you can just i mean if you have like artist fees your fees and you just can't find them include them in your fees and i sometimes suggest this that 
there's no way to, to write this, to have an invoice, to explain this. Maybe they can be part of your fees. But this is, you need to be communicated with your officer. But we do understand that. And, and one more thing, if I can jump in there, Victor, one more thing you can do is actually keep a record. You know, I always say, you know, keep a small notebook that you write expenses. And then those ones you cannot, you know, for example, if you come to Lagos and enter taxi, don't expect to get a, a taxi receipt. So you write it and jot it down. So you can, if the funder now wants a proof, you have written the time, the date and everything, the explanation and the cost. And that, that suffices. All right, thank you so much, Kathy and Paul. We have actually come to almost the end of this. It's been quite informative and I really appreciate your time. Um, a lot of things creatives are finding difficult and hardly come to a consensus on Paul and Kathy. You've used your experience to speak about this and we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. I couldn't take all the questions, of course. Um, there are a couple of questions that bother on whether we're going to send the slides or whether you have access to the presentation. Um, if I didn't answer you, the answer is yes. We are going to send the slides to all those who took part in this um, um, session. So the slides are going to be made available. And there are some questions that border on a couple of things that have been asked already. So um, for those that didn't get responses to their questions directly, we do apologize. We hope that we're able to touch on most of the major points and we will do our best to still provide answers to your questions even after the presentation has ended. So please do not feel discouraged. I would like to urge you to continue to keep an eye on our pages, try to join our community, you know, go to the website, ANF, africanofilter.org, uh, sign up to receive our newsletters, get updates and information about upcoming activities and upcoming um, um, ecosystem building initiatives. We've got a whole lot that we're planning and we are hoping that we can do um, at least one or two more of these kinds of sessions before December. So in the next couple of weeks, next couple of months, you will get some more information about the next subject. Some of you have indicated what areas and what subjects you would want ENF to do a webinar, a workshop, a masterclass, or a training on, and we're taking note of all of this feedback. We will work with your feedback. And so thank you so much for joining us today. And um, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for all of you that joined us from all parts of Africa. Thank you to my ANF colleagues as well, all of those, Nazia, Lerato, Sam, all of you who worked behind the scenes to make sure we had a very smooth operation and coordinated all the technicalities. Thank you so, so much.